I started playing baseball around seven or eight years old. I forgot when Pee Wee started. I didn't get to play t-ball, but that's fine. I didn't miss much there. But I played baseball all the way through my senior year in high school. And uh, it's kind of been a little bit hard because all, all of my three boys that have tried sports so far have tried it and it didn't take. And I don't know what, so it's not genetic. Baseball's not genetic. But I don't know how many times I stood at home plate and sat there with a bat in my hand hundreds of times over the course of playing baseball. Hundreds of times. Swinging away at baseball and there's one thing I never did. I never hit one. Home runs. <laughs> I never hit a home run. In all of those years, I never hit a home run. And I was thinking about why that was. And I don't know, and I'm not trying to really psychoanalyze myself too much, just a little bit. But I remembered when I was playing peewee at the old baseball field next to our swimming pool in Commerce, Texas, and the city pool and was behind us. And I could, man, I could just, I can remember it vividly. And I hit one. And the ball left higher and faster than I ever thought I'd seen it do before. Now, again, I'm eight years old, so it's not like a rocket. But I was sure it was going over the left center field fence. And I took off down the first baseline with victory, hands in the air. <laughs> to look over and see it bounce off the top of the fence and back into play. <laughs> to which, at time, my hands went from victory and to run really fast. So at least get a double. <laughs> I wasn't really embarrassed, but man, I was disappointed from the highest to highs to the lowest to lows. So I went on to play uh, throughout high school, never hit a home run. I batted, in my bragging rights, I batted 5'12 throughout high school. I hit the ball half the time I got up to, up to bat. And almost every time, it was the left center field, only it was a line drive. But I thought about it this week, and I think, I don't remember really swinging for the fence. I really didn't try. We had a guy on my, my team, he was going to hit a home run or he was going to strike out. And I used to fuss at him, I was like, Michael, don't, don't swing for the fence every time. And I wish Michael would have turned around and said, yeah, Casey, but you've got to swing for the fence some of the time. Otherwise, you're never going to hit one. You know, I wonder how many people are here today who are playing it safe like I learned how to do. I mean, I did not want to strike out and I didn't want to miss the ball so I played it safe and I got really really good at playing it safe I mean if you bat 300 in high school that's good if you bat 500 that's really good I'm just telling you that's that's a good batting average it's way above average average but my regret is I never really went for it I never really went for it. just made con now my coaches loved me because I was gonna get on base but looking back, I think, man, I wish I wouldn't have learned to play it so safe. And I believe that people do that in life. That, that many people are probably sitting here today and you're playing it safe. You went for the fence once or twice and it didn't work out. And you decided the, the feeling that followed that failure, that sense of not making it, wasn't so great. So you pulled back. How many of you minimizing the risk of failure today? I mean, that's just your mode of operation. You don't even think about it anymore. You just live life by minimizing the risk of failure, and you do only what you feel safe actually doing and succeeding in. I and mean, that's not something you do consciously anymore, maybe, but you live that way. If you look and your decision-making and the way you live life, that's how you do it. That's just how you live life. And I want to tell you something that hit me this week. When we play it safe, safe is generally all we get. When you learn to play it safe, you very well may learn like I did how to play it safe well. But I want to tell you, if you want to play it safe well, playing it safe well is probably all you get. Are you content with that? Are you content with playing it safe, getting through safely? Last week we started this walk with Ruth. And you might think that this Old Testament book about this woman named Ruth would be stale and irrelevant to your life in 2016 Topeka, Kansas. But I got to tell you, it is spot on with how we live and how we experience life. It is timeless and seamless as it steps into our world. And so what we asked you to do was just to engage the story. 
that we're not trying to exegete or study, analyze, study and analyze words and, and figure out deep. Th- we're just going to let the story kind of speak into our lives. In order to do that, I want to invite you to enter into the story. And one of the ways that you can do that is by seeing who in the story do you best identify with. So let me catch you up. If you missed last week, all we said was, was there was a man named Elimelech, his wife Naomi. They are in Judah. The famine strikes Judah. There's no food at all, so they moved to Moab. Subsequently, in Moab, a foreign land that was hostile to Judah, subsequently Elimelech dies. His two sons get married, and they marry women from Moab. Both of those sons die as well so Naomi is left alone in a foreign land by herself with two daughters-in-law named Ruth and Orpah now that's where we pick up the story today we're gonna see what do they do now Ruth is uh, or Naomi is widowed Ruth and Orpah are widowed and now what's the decision-making process how do they move forward where do they go with all of this and I really want you to look through the lens of these through three people today. Forget the fact that they're women because their gender doesn't have anything to do with it, guys. It's, it's a perspective on how you live and experience and respond to life. And you can enter into this story through one of these three people almost guaranteed. And so if, you could, if we could stop analyzing and studying and just go, tell us the story, God. Bring us into this moment. These were real people. This really happened. This is a historical story. It's, it's truth. It's reality. I want to just ask you to move right along into that today and ask God to give us the ability to do that. Would you pray with me? God, it's really important today. Really important, more important than we get. That we call to mind that we're very aware that where we are in life, all the stuff we brought into this room, all the things that are going on in us, our priorities, our pursuits, our ambitions, our, our fears, our pain, all that stuff matters to you. And we don't have to get rid of it to somehow connect with you. And, and the amazing supernatural work that you can do is you can take a story like we're going to look at this morning and you can meet people right in their mess, right where they are. They don't have to set something aside. They don't have to try to stop thinking about it. You just meet them there. God, my prayer today is those people who are crying out in their heart and they're confused or they're disappointed or they're uh, they're somehow bewildered or maybe they feel like they're on the top of the mountain and life is just as perfect as it's ever been, that right there in that moment, your reality would be unmistakable to them today. Father, I'm not nearly smart enough to know what exactly what you want to say to every person in this room. But I do know and I am utterly confident and convinced that you want to speak to every person in this room. And you want them to know that they are individuals before you, even though we gather corporately. You want them to know that they're known, that their pain and their frustration or their confusion or their boredom or even their excitement and joy all matters to you. I just pray that you would intersect us where we are today. Help me to do justice and tell the story as it is. And your Holy Spirit, Father, I pray would take over from there in Jesus' name. Amen. So Elimelech, the patriarch of the family, dies. Milon and Kilion both died too, the two sons. So we have Naomi, the mother, we have Ruth, the daughter-in-law, and Orpah, a daughter-in-law. Ruth has, or Naomi has, a decision to make, a real big decision, because in this society there was no real way for her to earn a living, to her to sustain herself. So she had to decide, where is her best chance? What does she do from here? Her decision is to go back to Judah. To go back to her homeland, it's, it's, it's a, it makes sense, right? She's got to go somewhere where she's known, where somebody cares for her, where somebody might take an interest, might take a, a provisional interest in her life. Now, the big question mark that follows that is, what do you, where do Ruth and Orpah go? The daughters-in-law who are now widowed too. 
And you would think it's just a no-brainer from this point for them to just part ways and for, for the daughters-in-law to say, we love you, we're going to stay here among our people because they're both women from Moab. And that Ruth would, or Naomi would just go back to Judah among her people. You would think that that would just be the natural break and how the story goes, but it doesn't go like that at all. Because when Naomi says she's going back to Judah, Ruth and Orpah say, we're going with you. No doubt that raised the eyebrows at Naomi, like, what? why would you leave your family, your people, your culture? Why would you leave all that and go with me? And so she entreats them, or she begs them, actually, to stay put. She actually goes through and says, I'm not going to have any more children. And even if I did, by the time they got old enough for you to marry, we'd all be old ladies. That's basically what she says. So why would you go with me? Return to your people, your gods, your country, and I'll return to mine. They both, at that first entreaty from Ruth, from Naomi, they both refused and say, no, we're going with you. We're going back to Judah with you. That's interesting. It's not interesting if you just read this as a Bible story and you just want to get through it and the end is the, what matters. But if you're taking a journey, and we said this last week, it's very important that you understand that we're taking a journey. It's like taking a walk. And when you take a walk, the destination's not nearly as important as the journey of taking a walk. Now, if you're exercising, then exercise is, uh, is, is the point. If you're trying to get from point A to point B, then, then, then the destination matters. But we're taking a walk. And on a walk, the journey and the experiences along the way are why you take the walk. And we're taking a walk with Ruth. And so we have to stop and say, isn't that interesting that these two Moabite women want desperately, even when they're given an out, right? She gave them the obligatory out. She said, don't feel obligated. You don't have to come with me. I totally understand. I think it would be wiser if you stayed. So she gave them every reason to stay there. They didn't have any sense of guilt. They weren't driven by that. But they just said, we're going with you. So they are already on the journey when she turns to them again and says, Please, don't do this. Go back home to your people and to your gods. Return to the place where you're going to be safe, where people know you, and they're going to care for you, where you can find a husband and, and live. There's no guarantees where we're going. The risk is good, great for me, but it's even greater for you. So she persisted in urging Ruth and Orpah to return to Moab. This is the second time she entreats them. She begs them. And after her second pleading to return, Orpah makes the decision to return. Now, it is through tears and a sense of reluctance that she goes home. I don't want us to see this wrongly like Orpah said, Whew, I'm glad she gave us that final out because I was ready to go. She didn't do that. She says they tearfully parted ways. But something prevailed in her mind, and she said, I'm, I'm going to do what Naomi's su suggesting I do. I'm going to go back home. Ruth makes a different decision entirely. Even when her sister-in-law now decides to return home, you would think there would be almost an irresistible pull for her to do the same. But Ruth doesn't. Ruth replies to Naomi with these incredible words of devotion. It says more than we'll ever be able to unpack today. But listen to these words. Ruth replied, don't make me leave you. I want to go wherever you go. And I want to live wherever you live. Your people shall be my people. Your God shall be my God. I want to die where you die. And be buried there. May the Lord do terrible things to me if I allow anything but death to separate us. Ruth said to Naomi. And the Bible says when Naomi saw that Ruth had made up her mind. That would be an understatement, right? God do terrible things to me if I don't stay with you until we both die. That's what she said. Ruth had made up her mind and could not be persuaded otherwise. She stopped urging her. So Orpah returns to Moab and Ruth and Naomi 
continue on to Judah. Now, when Naomi and Ruth get to Judah, you would think that maybe they could just slip in unnoticed. Like, here's just two women. They've been gone for over 10 years. Who's going to notice? Apparently, everybody noticed. Apparently, they were missed. Apparently, they knew, people knew that she had been gone. And when, when they arrived, people kept saying, Is it really Naomi? Is, that, is she really come home? Has this woman we've missed returned? And Naomi's response tells us a lot about where she's been and how she was feeling upon her return. Because you could get the, the wrong notion that she's like, Whew, I'm glad to be home. Isn't it great? It's so good to be home. Hugs and kisses to everybody. Now let's get on the business of finding me a guy that can take care of me and life will get on. Naomi doesn't respond that way at all. She says, don't call me Naomi anymore. You need to call me Mara. The reason is because Naomi, Naomi means pleasantness, delight, joy, or bliss. Mara, Mara mean, means bitterness. Naomi's assessment of the last 10 years of her life are summed up well in verse 20 when she says, I went out full. Everything was great, other than we didn't have any food, but when I left, life was good. But the Lord has brought me back empty. The Almighty has afflicted me. Now, it's important to get the tone of how she says that. It's not really of complaint, but of lament. There's a big difference between complaining and lamenting. <clears throat> complaining, there's an element of, I'm right and you're wrong. I don't like this and I want you to do something about it. Lament has the resignation to that this is the situation and I have to go through this. There's a resignation, a resolve. It's a sorrowful resolve. It's a bitter resolve, but it's a resolve. And, and, this, and, and, and Naomi's going through that. She doesn't seem to be mad at God. She's not really pointing his finger and saying, I can't believe you did this. She's just saying, this is what God has allowed to play out in my life. Things have turned bitter. Things have been hard. The Almighty has allowed affliction to set in on my life. There's a, a submission to the sovereignty of God here that is really, really poignant, powerful. Now, we're going to stop right there in the middle of that part of the story, and we're going to move on to talk about these three ladies and their experiences, and specifically their decisions. And I want you to see who you relate to, where you best fit in. That's why we started this message with, are you a play it safe kind of guy, kind of lady? You step up to the plate and say, I'm going to just hit the ball. I'm not going for it all. I don't want to miss. I don't want to fail. But I don't want to swing for the fence. So let's look at Orpah. She seems to be this devoted. We don't know a lot about her, first of all. But we, she seems to be a very devoted, a very loving person. And she seems to have something very, um, she seems to have a very real attraction and devotion to Naomi. She loves Naomi. She cares for Naomi. That's seen in her willingness to at least, I mean, so she was sincerely going to Judah until Naomi implored her the second time. So most of her wants to go there. She clearly loves her mother-in-law, clearly feels a devotion there. There's a strong attachment is what we're getting at. It's not an easy thing for her to part ways. That's important to know in the story. And when it comes down to it, Orpah looks ahead at her life. She just looks at the landscape of going this way versus going back this way. Because Naomi insists that she, she survey the landscape of going forward or going backwards. And at some point in all of that, finally she decides that it makes more sense for her to do what Naomi is urging for her to do, even though it's a very hard thing for her to do. And Orpah chooses security or safety over all other options. And that's not a bad thing. I'm not placing a judgment on that. That sounds like something I would say in kind of with, with a tone of judgment. I'm not doing that. She says, if you know, going forward, looking back, 
going, going to Judah or going home, I think that it is best for me to go home. Naomi thought it was best for her to go home too. So she chooses that. She makes the decision for security. Don't place a value judgment. If you, if you place a value judgment on that, you're going to have a harder time entering into her world. Okay, just, just see it for what it is, and that's what she chooses. So only, and that was only at the persistence of Naomi and her old life, her old people, her gods, her former gods. She returns to those with tears in her eyes. And we aren't told how that plays out for her. Obscurity seems to be her, her story from that point. But you have, you, have you been there where Orpah was at that moment? Have you ever had this powerful drawing to, the, to the, maybe the things of God or to a, to a new start in life or to, to an adventure or, or to a massive, what you saw maybe as a massive risk, but something was appealing to you about it? Have you ever been there and, then, and, and you've had people around you possibly saying, no, don't do that. That doesn't make any sense at all. Think about this. You could go back, Orpa. And you know if you go back, somebody's going somebody's to come alongside. If you find a husband there, people care about you, people know you, it's familiar, go back. Have you ever had to make a decision like that that puts your heart and your head in conflict because that's where she was her most of her heart seems to want to go forward but everything in her head is telling her to go backwards even Naomi I don't think that's an uncommon experience for people of God I don't care if you're in grade school middle school high school college in the middle of your career at the end of your career in retirement we are often as people of God followers of Jesus put in that position where our head wants to do something and our heart wants to do something different and it's in a conflict okay and so now without without writing the script further for you just let that land in your life and let's look at Ruth maybe you find yourself wrapped up in her story and her experience same decision-making process Ruth is the same crossroads that Orpah found herself at but Ruth chooses a different path doesn't she Ruth chooses a new life and you would have to put in parentheses, risk, adventure, danger, all of that goes in this new life. She chooses that new life over all other options. Over everything else, she chooses to forge ahead. Let's just see if we find God using her story to connect with us. This woman who has also a fierce devotion to Naomi, boy, it's important for you to realize this, that, that the common thread here is what they see in Naomi, what they know of this woman, the impact of their relationship with her, because Judah is a foreign thing to them, totally, literally and metaphorically. It's an unknown. The known quantity is Naomi and her faith. And Ruth says, I'm going with you. And it doesn't appear that there's a shred of reluctance in this woman's bones. She said, I'm going, your people are becoming my people. Your God is going to become my God. Where you live, I'm going to live. And where you die, that's where I'm going to die. No ifs, no ands, no buts. Full steam ahead. Ruth can't even imagine leaving Naomi at this point. <laughs> you can clearly see, like it's not, have you ever talked to somebody and their mind is so made up, you just realize halfway through your, your argument to convince them otherwise that you're just beating your head up against a cinder block wall. This is going nowhere. They are not considering other options. They are just fixed on this. Now it's important to know that that is Ruth's mindset, but why that mindset is in place is equally important, and it has everything to do with what she's seen in this woman, Naomi. She's like, what she has, I have to have. What I know of her, I want of her. I cannot, after these 10 years or however long it's been, I cannot envision my life apart from this relationship. I have to go forward no matter where forward takes me. 
If it means leaving my family, if it needs leaving my gods, my culture, my familiarity, everything that looks secure and safe that might be an answer for my problem, I'm willing to leave all of that for this relationship. It's amazing. There's a reason the book is the book of Ruth and not the book of Naomi. Partly because Ruth becomes the great-great-grandmother of David, of course. But I can't help but point out something. That the power of relationship can prevail over everything else. Even when the woman she has a relationship with is urging her. She's not suggesting. She is urging. She's almost pleading with, with Ruth to go back. And part of that is because Naomi loves Ruth. And she wants what's best for Ruth. In Naomi's mind, it's only one option. Go back. Live in Moab. I'll be okay. I don't have anything to offer you. But she had everything to offer Ruth, according to Ruth. Maybe you're that person who, like Naomi, has suffered some, some really bitter life experiences. I mean, you wouldn't have written the script like this for anything. You, you wouldn't have looked ahead and said, hey, I want to go through this, this, and this, and this is where I'll land. Maybe you're still in the middle of trying to unpack it all or make sense of it all, and maybe you've even come to the point that it's just not going to make perfect sense. But... But something about this Jesus, something about this new life, so rich, so compelling, so necessary, like oxygen is to your body, this relationship with Jesus is to you, that it doesn't matter where it takes you. It doesn't matter how secure it looks. None of that even factors into your decision-making process. You're just on this beautiful adventure that has risk and reward written all over it, that has danger, that has excitement, that has adventure, that has even failure as a common theme through it, doesn't matter. You feel loved like you've never felt loved before. You feel a depth of attachment that you've never felt before, and you cannot help but go into a beautiful tomorrow, even though the beautiful tomorrow, according to those who logically look at your situation, would say is, is incredibly foolish, incredibly risky. Now listen, if you had gone back to Moab and said, hey, let's survey 10 of your closest friends or your relatives, do you think this is a good idea for Ruth to go to, to, go to Judah? They would have said, no, heck no. It's crazy. That's insanity. But if you, if you get inside of Ruth's mind, what she would have said, it is crazy, it is insane to even look back. I see something in this woman, Naomi, that I've got to have. That I trust more than I trust myself. I'm going where she goes. I'm following this new life. Have you ever been there when you just feel compelled to go into this risky future? This life that we've been calling you to at Covenant? of obedience to Jesus above all other things, above the logic, uh, uh, above the standards of our culture, above reason, above all things. You just say, I've got to go with this Jesus. He loves me more than I've ever been loved before. I've seen something in Him that I can't deny. Maybe you're like Naomi and like Orpha and Ruth. Life's dealt some bitter blows. But inside you know God is good and faithful. Maybe you're not Ruth that's excited about tomorrow. That's going into a glorious future of adventure. Maybe there's a resigned submission at this point in your world to the sovereignty and the goodness of God. That is in your head and your heart. You know God is good, but it hasn't felt good. But it hadn't swayed you. You trust the Father like you've never trusted Him before. You just know He has allowed some things you wouldn't have allowed, but He allowed them and you trust the outcome. Maybe life feels bitter. Maybe it's even affected your identity as much as it's affected Naomi's.
You have no idea how you're facing life right now. You may have no idea. I need you to listen close. This is an important, important part of this message for those of you who have suffered greatly, and there are many in this room who have suffered greatly. You may have no idea how the rugged, authentic, raw honesty of your faith and your steadfast submission to the authority and the leadership of God, regardless of your circumstances, you may have no idea how that is playing out in the people who are watching you do life. You don't put a fake smile on, but you don't hang your head and become a poor me person. Maybe you, like Naomi, walk right into Judah. And say, life has been really hard. But God is still really good. And I don't pretend to like this. But I do love God. And I don't understand how it's going to play out. But I know it's going to play out. And he will be with me step for step. Maybe this isn't how you wrote your script. Everybody does that, by the way. We all have a script. How you envision your life. And that's natural. It's actually unavoidable how you see your life unfolding. And man, when you look back at your script, even if you've been on this planet a short time, you can see that it's probably massively diverged from the script that you wrote. Now you can get bitter about that. You can get real bitter about that. And you can take your life into your hands and get control and do everything you know to do to just say, this is my life, and by gosh, I'm not letting it go bad anymore. Forget God. Forget all that stuff. I've got to get control here because this is too hard to go through again. And you can do that. You can walk back into Judah and say, I tried that Jesus thing, and it didn't work for me, and I'm done. Or you can walk back into Judah and say, man, it's hard. It's been so rough that I just don't see myself like I used to see myself. But I'll tell you who's the same, and that is this good God. And I don't understand how it's playing out or why it's playing out, but I do know that it's playing out, and I sense His love and His presence with me. And that sense, we know, is validated by Ruth and Orpah's massive devotion to Naomi. There we have it. Three women. At the crossroads of their lives, really hard choices to make. Hard truths to accept. A lot of risk in the balance. Painful experiences, but very real. Very, very personal and very faithful to a good God who's superintending it all. God often speaks through the stories of others. In fact... The very crux of Christianity is given to us in the story of Jesus. Don't discount how powerful it can be to intersect the reality of God through the story of another person. Testimonies are an important thing. And we're reading them. Don't think you have to make something happen today as you read this. Don't think you've got to figure it out or get the hidden clue. Just let it land in your life today. Let there be a freedom to just say, that's the story. God, if you want to use that in my life, I'm just open to that. You tell me some stuff that I want to hear and I need to hear and I'm open. But you're going to be amazed at how easily you can hear God through the story of other people if you'll let yourself hear God. It's not all about analyzing a passage and cross-referencing. That helps. That's good. I'm a student of God's Word myself. And I believe it's important to understand context and even down to the very tense of a, of a verb. But I also know that that matters nothing if we don't let the narrative of God wash over us like a tidal wave and sweep us away into a reality that we maybe could not even describe. These women are not unlike you. The beauty of God, the majesty of God, the glory, is he wrote stories in the history of people's lives that would transcend time. And you know that. Many of you right now know that. And their stories transcend it all. I've been right there. I know what he's talking about. 
They're not unlike yours. In some way, they could be your story. And that matters today. Let them be. Let them be. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to ask you to write your story snapshot, okay? I know there are people here that when you talk about writing, you just go, I don't want to write anything. Get over it. Just today. Get over it for today. I don't care if you spell well. I don't care if you think you articulate your words well in writing. This is important. Just do this. No one's going to grade it. No one's even going to see it but you and God. And he already knows what a crummy writer you may be. It doesn't matter. I, I'm just telling you it doesn't matter. Up until this point in your journey of faith, or even in your journey of considering faith, if that's where you are, in Jesus, how would you characterize your story in one or two or three sentences? It doesn't have to be... Man, if you want to write a page about that, that's great. But in one or two or three sentences, just try to get there. Here, and I've given you some examples. Like, it's been dark and challenging at times, but I'm seeing more and more light ahead. Okay, that's a snapshot of your story. Maybe life has been good, but I'm beginning to want significance more than comfort. Maybe that's a snapshot of your story. Or I've spent my life as a Christian trying to learn how to behave for Jesus. And now I really want to learn how to become like Jesus. Maybe that's a snapshot of your story. Maybe those don't even get at it. Just honesty and thoughtfulness need to go into it, okay? So I want you to give some thought to that in defining moments uh, think through scriptures, think through not even just scriptures, but man, those times when life turned you in a different direction. Those will be the, the, the turning points. Those will be the epics of the story, the, the high points that, that really help define you. So I, I want you to do that. I think it'll be it's just for you and God, all right? Just for you and God. But if you want to, and you want to shoot me an email or, or write it out and hand it to me on a paper copy and just for me to hear, I'd love to hear your stories. That would be a re really, really high privilege. I understand that. That may be intensely personal to you, and I'm not asking to get in there and know your stuff. But if you want to share it with somebody, man, that'll be, I, I promise you I'll be uh, confidential if you want me to be confidential. But if you just got to share it with somebody, I mean, obviously choose a spouse first, a parent, a brother, a sister, a trusted friend. But if you just want to share it, and if you want to share it so that I could share it, if you say, man, I don't care who knows this, then, then let me have it. I'd love some of the snapshots to go in our bulletin on our website, maybe even share on a Sunday morning. That would be really good. It doesn't have to be wrapped up with a nice pretty bow at the end. It doesn't have to have any certain theme. It just has to be your story. Let me pray God uses it. Father, I'm going to ask you in the great name of Jesus to do this, to take our stories and help us to understand the movement that you have been moving with in our lives and God I desperately am asking you to help us to become a church that helps people become like Jesus and not just behave for him I'm asking you to help us make disciples men and women and young people who are learning how to live life from Jesus that we're not just trying to follow rules but we're trying to invest in a relationship that is transformational and God, we're just not trying to offer programs to have people come support the programs, but we're trying to do ministries that help people engage the living God of this universe in such a way that it changes the essence and the kind of people we are, that we think differently, that we feel differently, we talk differently, that we become different kinds of people who don't settle for living in conflict with our hearts for the rest of our lives, doing things that we think we should do, but we don't ever want to do. And God, that's a recipe for failure. So... Set us free from that, and you make us brand new creations. Give us the life that is abundant and free that Jesus promised, and we want to represent you well. We'll ask all of that in Jesus' great name. Amen.